Click, 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 click. Yes, that's why only Cole said cold morning. Everyone else would have said cold morning back. Um, we're not going to let anything stop us from praise this morning. Hopefully we can turn our thoughts and our minds to the Lord. Sometimes when I don't eat, um, <clears throat> he said, read from a book, and he mentioned about fasting. He said, fasting is a reminder of our dependence on God. And so when I feel hungry, then I think, oh, I need to depend on God. It's a reminder every time we feel hungry, we depend on God. Maybe we feel cold, even then we need to depend on God. We can set our minds on Him. And we're singing, May the Peoples Praise You first this morning. So we've been going through the book of Acts, and we've seen that the gospel spread to all nations, um, all peoples. All peoples can join in the worship of the Lord. So let's stand together and sing the song with joy. You have called us out of darkest night into your glorious light that we may sing Tell the grace that broke into our strife With boundless love and deepest joy With endless life May the peoples praise you Let the nation be glad All your blessing comes That we may praise May praise the name Jesus. Let's bring a let's bring a clap to the Lord. The earth is yours and all within. Each harvest is your own, and from our hand we give to you to make Christ known. May the seeds of mercy grow in us. For the who have not heard May songs of praise Build lives of grace To spread your word May the peoples praise you Let the nations be glad All your blessing comes That we may praise May praise the name of and your name to every nation tribe and tongue your church proclaim may the peoples praise you let the nation be glad all your blessing comes that we may praise may praise the name of Jesus
Good morning, everybody. You may have a seat. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Hey, good uh, cold morning, as Andy did say. I apologize for the coldness, but I believe it is God's way of uh, challenging us to uh, sit closer to one another. You know, we have free heating. It's called your body, all right? And so I'm going to give you the opportunity, as you're shivering in your coats right now, to, yes, you may move out of your seats and sit closer with somebody, maybe up in the front. So don't be ashamed, all right? If you're, you know, if you happen to have somebody next to you who doesn't mind you hugging them, feel free to do that while you're listening to the word. Also, Dustin, uh, as a uh uh, graciously, he has uh, given people uh, heating pads, right? Those heat, hand warmer thing. So if you don't have one, go ahead and get one from the front, on the front entrance, and just warm yourself up. But again, I do highly recommend that you guys just simply uh, stick together, just like the church body. Anyway, with that said, I am Pastor Terry. I am so glad to see you guys uh, this morning. Uh, we just have a couple announcements. We have three words that we want to share with you. Number one is grow. Here at Impact Church, we are centered and sent. And uh, being centered in Christ means that you grow as you're connected to the true vine. And the way that we do that is through our community groups. So every week we meet in Northern Virginia in community groups, coming together, living life together, reading the word together, praying for one another, and loving one another. So if you're not connected to a community group, if you're not attending a community group, right, you're not in trouble yet, but we highly encourage you to come and connect with Andy, who will share and connect you with a community group near you or near your time, all right? So please grow in that way. Also, we also have men's group. We have men's and women's group meet on Saturday. This Saturday is men's group. We are going through a series on biblical manhood. I am enjoying it quite a bit, so please come on out 10 o'clock this Saturday as well. The next word I want you to know is to connect with us. If you see around your seats, you should see response cards the old-fashioned way. I love them because as you fill them out, you fill out your prayer requests. Uh, we read through them all and we pray for them after church service. So please come and connect with us that way as well. Just share your prayer requests. We want to hear what God is doing in your life as well. You can also connect to us by giving your tithes and offerings through the black box in the front, also through Venmo, and also through online giving, which is on the slide as well. And lastly, the last word I want you guys to know is to serve. We at Impact Church are centered and sent, so we go out as much as possible. So very two uh, quick announcements. Mark your calendar. December 17th, we have a Christmas event with the uh, Meadows community. So not only are we going to be handing out food, but we're also going to be working with McLean Bible Church to hand out presents to the families in that area. And it was really cool. We sing uh, Christmas songs. We carol. There's Christmas trees set up. And then we break it down after one hour. But it's still cool. It's really a lot of fun. So please, December 17th, Saturday in the morning. So mark your calendars. Also, December 18th, more details to come. But we have probably one of the biggest outreach events that Impact Church is going to be working with. We're going to be serving, hopefully... 80 students, which means around roughly 350 to 400 people in general, and we're going to be uh, doing a Christmas block party indoors alongside with two other churches and also Fairfax County as well. So please look forward to that December 17th and December 18th as well. Last, last reminder, uh, I know you guys are sad but we are getting rid of Realm. All right? We know announced that last week. Some of you guys don't even know what Realm is. All right, nod your heads if you have no idea what Realm is. All right, very good. <laughs> that's, see, that's why we're getting rid of Realm. All right, Realm was our announcement forum for our church, but because the, the, you know, the culture is shifting back into texting again, we are now going through our texting service. So please, if you're not signed up for it, please go ahead and uh, click on or text that num uh, number. And just say, yeah, I want announcements. Or just give us your name, and we will sign you up for it. And you will hear from us every once in a while. How can we pray for you? What are some announcements? What are some needs? And so forth. All right? So we're going to sing a couple more songs. Uh, thank you to the praise team. We're going to hear from Go Time about some awesome things happening in December. And we're going to hear from God's Word from Pastor Bob as well. Take it away, praise team. All right. Thank you, Pastor Terry. Stand back up. The song, Blessed Be Your Name. <clears throat> Apostle Paul and uh, the apostles went through a lot in the book of Acts, a lot of uh, struggles and troubles, but their portion was Jesus Christ. He was their strength, not the comforts of the world, not uh, I'm going to hurry up and get home so I can take a break. Um, they were on mission. The song reminds us that it's the Lord who takes care of us.
Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place. Though I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. With every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be your name when the sun is shining down on me. When the world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering. Though there's pain in the offering, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in Lord still I will say blessed be the name of the Lord blessed be your name blessed be the name of the Lord blessed be your glorious name blessed be the name of the Lord blessed be your name Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. You give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Oh, blessed be your name. You give and take away. You give and take away, my heart will choose to say, for oh, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, blessed be Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. the heroes of the faith and I wonder what are they like are they like mighty and perfect and doing everything right or, or are they like me that's when I think of the heroes of the faith in the Bible they're not they're not perfect they're broken they're insecure they struggle and yet God calls them and uh, someday we will stand beside them the heroes of the faith aren't the people who are got it all together, the ones who are following Christ, the one who has it together and living after his way. I pray that we can have the comfort of knowing that uh, we have a hope in heaven, but that we have a task on earth.
is gone and mercy fills the street. Look upon the one who bled to save me. Walk with him through all eternity. There will be a day when all will bow before him. There will be a day when that will be no more. Standing face to face with he who died and rose again. Holy, holy is the The songs of faith we sang through doubt and fear, and in the end we'll see that it was worth it when He returns to wipe away our tears. There will be a day when all will bow before Him. There will be a day when that will be no more. Standing face to face with He who died and rose again. Holy, holy is the And beside the heroes of the faith, with one voice, a thousand generations sing, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. And on that day, join the resurrection and stand beside the heroes of the faith with one voice a thousand generations sing worthy is the lamb who was slain forever he shall reign let it be today we shout the hymn of heaven with angels and the saints. We raise a mighty roar. Glory to our God who gave his life beyond the grave. Holy, holy is the Lord. So let him be today. We shout the hymn of heaven. With angels and the saints, we raise a mighty roar. Glory to our God, who gave His life beyond the grave. Holy, holy is the Lord. Holy, holy is the Lord. Holy. Oh, what a peace, my highest. 
greatest joy and my deepest need now and forever he is my light i stand in the gospel of jesus Christ. there is one gospel to which i cling all else i count as lost for there where justice and mercy be he saved me on that cross no more i boast in what i can bring no more i carry the weight of sin for he has brought me from death to life I stand in the gospel of Jesus There is one gospel where hope is found And empty tomb still speaks For death could not keep my Savior down He lives and I am free on my Savior I fix my eyes my life is his and his hope is mine for he has promised I too will rise I stand in the gospel of Jesus gospel the church is one we do not walk alone we have his spirit as we press on to lead us safely home and then when in glory still i will sing of this whole story that rescued me praise to my savior the king alive I stand in the gospel of Jesus Christ, and when in glory still I will sing of this old story that rescued me. Praise to my Savior, the King alive. I stand in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Praise to my Savior, the King alive. I stand in the gospel of Jesus Christ. I stand in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for this gospel, this hope that we have. This hope, God, that we can be in your presence and know you, that we can have life in you, life that will never end, um, that we can have peace that passes all understanding. Um, comfort, Lord, comfort that is not secured in this life, but secured in the next. Um, we pray, Lord, that you would give uh, us understanding to your word, that we might um, be strengthened by it to know and follow you intimately. Lord, that we wouldn't just be uh, following you on the days when we show up here for a couple hours, but Lord, that we would walk with you every day be it with uh, our families, our friends, alone, God, with our church, that we would walk with you in uh, intimacy, surrounding ourselves both with people that we want to show your love to, maybe for the first time, or even um, with people that love you. May we walk together in the name of Jesus. Amen.
you know, I think it's okay to clap for them. Especially when it's 57 degrees in the worship center. It's, you can clap, put your hands together because it warms them up. You know, it's like, yes. Hey, if you don't know, I'm Pastor Bob. I'm one of the two pastors here on staff, um, pastors, elders here on staff. I'm going to rearrange um, because I'm going to do calisthenics up here. It's warming up a little bit. Until you smile, I'm, I'm going to keep going. Hey, seriously, I was getting ready. You know, how do you know you've been in the book of Acts too long? Is because I was reading through Acts. I was getting ready for this sermon. And um, I was reading through Acts. Andy, I'm sorry, i got to move this. I know, your day just was ruined. But I was reading through Acts, and, and I was reading through uh, when Paul uh, changed to Saul. And I, I, was, I was reading through Acts, and I was going through this, and I was going, hey, I was wondering... Did Paul lose his sight because he never saw Jesus coming? No. I know, that, that joke is appalling. But, um, yeah, yeah it, it doesn't get better from here because the only thing worse than pastor jokes are dad jokes. Seriously. You know, but you know you've been a financial advisor too long when you, I was wondering, how could Jesus afford to pay it all? It's pretty easy because, you know, he saves. <laughs> he saves all the time. Yeah, I better get into the word, don't you think? Hey, today um, we're we've done a we've done a very long um, study in the book of Acts. I, I believe it's been over five months. And today, what I was going to do, my sermon title is "Time to Grow," and you'll see why in a minute. But um, my sermon title is "Time to Grow." Um, and what I was going to do today was I, I'm going to do a quick, uh, a very quick summary or survey is a better word. Um, so open your Bible today to chapter 21. Acts chapter 21. This is where you, you open your Bible. I should hear Bible flipping. Um, that's page 2,685 in my Bible. So chapter 21 of Acts. Thank you. So in Acts chapter 21... Um, we have spent the better part of um, five months, almost six months, going from Acts chapter 1 up to chapter, through chapter 20. Now, why do we do this? Why, why do we do, uh, why do, we do an exposition of, of a book of the Bible? And the, the real answer is because uh, Pastor Terry and I are not very creative. So we can't make up things to teach. Um, we basically just teach what's in the Bible. And, um, and that's why you should come. That's why you should come to church. You see, you should not want my opinion. You should want what's in the Bible. You should not want what I believe, but you should want to know what is in the Bible. And that's what we try to instruct you on, is what the Word says. But real fast, what I wanted to do was, was take us through chapter 21 through 28, and literally, chapter 21, Paul goes on to Jerusalem. He gets to Jerusalem, he does his thing, he preaches and he teaches, and he gets arrested and he gets in trouble. Because Paul just keeps telling the message about Jesus Christ. In chapter 22, it goes on. Um, the Jews don't like what he has to say. They arrest him. Um, we have this funny trial where he gets bounced back and forth between um, the Sanhedrin and between, uh, between, sorry, you hear that? The onion paper in my Bible is flipping back and forth. Between Felix and King Agrippa. I just love that name, King Agrippa. But he gets back, back, back and forth. Um, this trial reminds me of what Jesus went through. So there's a little um, metaphor there, a little uh, action. kind of reminds me of what Jesus went through and King Agrippa. But Paul insists on, on his day before the... Because he's a Roman citizen, he, is, he insists on his day before, um, before the, the magistrate in Rome. And so he gets sent to Rome. He sails off to Rome. Um, he's on his way to Rome, and then we have this, he, he gets, he gets uh, the Holy Spirit tells him, you're going to go to Rome, and, but you gotta, you, you're going to get shipwrecked. And I, I love this story because an angel tells him, you, you're going to go through a shipwreck, and, it, and, and he tells the people on the ship, if you, if you do exactly what I say, none of you will die. And I, I love this because it, it represents a story of what Jesus tells us. If you do what I tell you, you won't die. And they run onto the ship, or they have this funny story, and they, they, you know, 
but he runs onto, uh, into a sandbar, and they were going to kill Paul, but they save Paul, and they, they have this, this, this really cool story, and they, they finally, they, they actually get onto Malta, this little island, and then they build a fire, and they do this, and this viper, this snake bites Paul in the hand. I love this story because Paul's like, ouch, and he flicks the snake into the fire. He says, I don't got time to die. Um, he doesn't really say that, but that's kind of what happens. And the, the locals go, that, that's, that's a super deadly viper. He should be dead. Oh, he, and he said, he, you know, he's a criminal. He should die. And Paul said, he doesn't even, he do, it doesn't faze him. He just flips him in the fire. He doesn't die. It's an amazing story. Um, they gain favor, the local people there. Um, and, it, and he goes on. And then they, they get on a ship again, and he finally gets to Rome. And once he gets to Rome, they tie him up to a guard. He rents a house. Um, he's there for two years. He's preaching this story, and it kind of ends there. They don't walk him through the, the trial and the death, but it's an amazing story. And what I want to share with you is don't stop. Don't cheat yourself out of the rest of the book. Now, we're not going to preach it, and we're not going to teach it letter for letter, word for word, but don't stop. You know the number one reason why people don't know their Bible? Because they don't read it. Simply, you just don't read it. So don't stop. Don't cheat yourself. And what I would suggest is I challenge the community group leaders, before our next community group, I challenge you all to read chapters uh, 21 through 28 on your own. It's, a, it's an amazing story. It's kind of cool. Um, I, I gave you the cliff notes. That should be a primer. You know, it should be exciting. Uh, I love the part where the viper bites him and he's like, get off me. I don't got time for you. I'm, I'm winning souls, but get off me. Flip. But here's your, and, and, and our community group, which is by far the best, I'm sorry, Pastor, but um, by far the best because we have a professional IBQ um, creator that's a icebreaker questions done by our own Cole Pally. But um, I suggest that next time you get together, uh, community group leaders, you might want to suggest a, an IBQ question, which is, whether or not Acts 28.5 adds a bite to the story. So just go ahead and look that one up for the next IBQ. The takeaway is don't cheat yourself. The book is worth the read. All right. Let's transition. For the last five months, we've taken a walk through the book of Acts, chapter by chapter. We've been faithfully unfolding the birth of the church and the works of Peter and Paul and the rest of the band. And up until chapter 20, now we're going to go back and summarize the why, the why we've walked through the book of Acts. We've invested so much time and effort in this process. The key to discovering the why is found in what Jesus' words were and found in chapter 1, which is what we've used as our focus verse And while, while, uh, I'm sorry, while we were summarizing. So now truly open your Bibles to chapter 1, verse 8. We started there last week with Pastor Terry. So the context of chapter 1 and verse 8, while you're going there, let me give you the context. In chapter 1, as you may remember, Jesus had just, had just hung out with his disciples for 40 days after his resurrection, and they wanted to know if he was going to restore the kingdom of Israel. And Jesus tells them that that's a secret that only the Father knows. And then we go right into chapter 8. And chapter 8 is, I'm sorry, not chapter 8, verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witness in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Last week, Pastor Terry taught us what Jerusalem was and the Holy Spirit. I'm not going to re-preach what Pastor Terry taught us last, last week because, quite frankly, it was an excellent sermon. There's not a lot of room for me to reteach or re-preach anything. But he taught us a couple of different things, and he, he likened Jerusalem, for him, was Koreans. Um, it was a close-knit community group that he could identify with, and it was easy for him to identify with, Koreans or Korean-Americans, and nerds. Now, I immediately said nerds candy, because he, he identifies with candy, because I don't see Pastor Terry as a nerd. Um, because in my day, when somebody called you a nerd, it, it was fighting words. But in, in your guys' day, I guess it's a compliment. But... Nerds, um, he identifies himself with and, and, and can communicate with and relate well with Koreans and nerds. So 
that was, that was his Jerusalem, if you will. And also the Holy the Spirit, he, he made a big deal about, and rightfully so, that the Spirit indwells us. And I wanted to park there for a minute. If we are truly born again, which is the story that we find in, in John chapter 3, um, the Nicodemus story, where Nicodemus comes to, to Jesus at night and he says, hey, what is this born again thing? Am I supposed to crawl back into my mother's womb and be born again? And he says, Nick, buddy, you got, you're supposed to be a, a seminary professor and you got this thing backwards. You don't understand what you're talking about. Born again is the concept that you get a new heart, a new life, and you turn your, your heart of stone to a heart of life. And Jesus, the Holy Spirit, indwells you, and you now get true life. Then the Holy Spirit indwells you, and that's what Pastor Terry taught us last week, is that it is truly a life-changing event. And that, that is our Jerusalem, that when, when the Holy Spirit takes us, now we have this a new life, and now we can identify with people that we're close to. And what I wanted to pile on a little bit with was perhaps if we're truly born again, perhaps it's time that we start asking or stop asking God when we pray to give, stop asking him to give us more of the Holy Spirit because we already have that. Perhaps we should start asking God, maybe we should give more of us to the Holy Spirit. You see, if we want to become more like Christ, then maybe our prayer shouldn't be, Lord, give me more of the Spirit. But perhaps, Lord, give me the courage to be, give more of myself to the Spirit. Maybe I should learn to yield more of myself to the Spirit. Perhaps we should start praying that I want to become more like you as opposed to give me more of you. You see, because the day that, that the Holy Spirit indwelled you, that's what you got. You got the Holy Spirit. If you pray for more, you already got it. Perhaps you should pray that you, you become, you give more of yourself to the Spirit. Yield more of yourself to the Spirit. So this week, I'm going to unpack um, what Judea and Samaria is. Typically, when this section of Scripture is preached, it's preached as, as, as if it's in proximity. So typically, it's preached, okay, we have Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, three concentric, concentric rings, or three um, rings as in proximity. So you've got the closest one, the next closest one, and the third closest one. And that's not inaccurate, but I want to add um, perhaps uh, an extra layer, pun intended, uh, a way of thinking about this. Um, I want us to consider it to be a demographic. So besides being um, also a close connection, as in another layer, I want us to also consider it to be a demographic. So where Jerusalem would be the first one, Judea would be the next one in demographic it would all, in, in its next layer, but also in its demographic. For example, Jerusalem might be, I'm sorry, Judea might be, in our example, the United States. The United States would be a Jerusalem for us. I'm sorry, it would be a Judea for us. Jerusalem might be your family or Koreans or nerds. Not for me, because I'm not a nerd, but um, for Pastor Terry, it would be a nerd. Um, but that would be your, your um, Jerusalem. Your Judea, perhaps, would be your community, Virginia, Fairfax County, or the United States. I chose the United States because it's very similar. We have a similar language, a similar history. We have a currency, and oftentimes we have national goals. We have national sovereignty. That would be our Judea. We have things in common that make it relatively easy for us to connect, to understand one another. The point is, it's where the Lord puts you and where you have a lot in common, thus allowing multiple connection points to build relationships and a launching point for the propagation of the gospel. That would be your, well, that would be your Judea. And you see, your Jerusalem would be the people you have an affinity with and your your Judea would be the next layer, but it would also be the people that you have multiple connection points with, not necessarily, a dem um, but through demographic. The question I had when I was going through this is, are you, are we, am I, taking advantage of these Judeas in our life? You see, guys, not, not women, but men, 
tend to compartmentalize our lives. We have a box in our brain called work box. And then we have a box in our brain called home box and church, church box and whatever other box you have, you know, golf, golf box and hunting box or whatever box you have. Um, I, I don't, women's brains don't work that way because they, they, they're just scattered. Uh, there's like scrambled eggs. They're, just, they're, they're all put together and, you know, you guys connect all differently. But I wonder that are we, are we taking advantage of our Judeas? Are we, are we a Christian in all of our boxes? I'm going to give a quick example of this, and forgive me, my community group has heard this so many times, but when I first moved to Virginia, um, I was advised by a spiritual mentor of mine that when I got introduced to, the, to, the, um, to my office where I worked in my district, that besides given the demographics, you know, who I am and what I'm, who, you know, I'm, I'm a family man, I'm doing this, to stand up and say, in my introduction, say, and I follow Jesus Christ. And it, it was so awkward. I mean, who does that? I mean, who shows up at work on your first day and put on your best suit and tie and say, you know, I'm Bob and I have two children and, and I'm this and I'm that and I, you know, I went to this university and I got this degree and I did this and I've been in the business this long and, and you know, and, and I, I like to ride motorcycles and I like to do this and, and I follow Jesus Christ. And the room kind of went quiet. Some people looked at me in horror, like, ooh, you know, like, you can't say that in public. And some people looked at me um, with sympathy, like, oh, I can't believe you said that in public. And other people um, looked away in shock. But throughout the years, I've been in that particular office for about 22 years, and throughout the years, people have managed to make their way to my office, some asking for prayer, some asking for counsel, and some, some um, invariably... Um, allowing me to um, express my faith. And what it did was it held me accountable. Um, I had multiple times um, to, um, to pray with people, to minister to people. Whenever I walk into a conference room or whenever I walk into a lunch room, um, the language changes. So it just, I just expressed myself that I was going to be a Christian, and they said, fine, um, that was my Judea, and they said, you can be a Christian here. And I am glad I took that advice. So are we taking advantage of the Judeas that God has put in our lives? But now I want to spend the bulk of my time on the much more problematic some areas of our lives. As I was preparing this sermon, it was not lost on me that Jesus chose Samaria in this example. So Samaria is problematic because at this point, Jesus was in chapter 1, verse 8. Jesus was talking to his disciples, and he says, Jerusalem, Judea, and his disciples are going, yes, we can do that. We can tell our people. These are our people. We, we can tell our people about this. These are friendly, nice Jews. We can talk to them. And Samaria, and they went, wait, what? I'm sure the first two, they're bobbing their head. They're going, yes, yes, Lord, we can do this. We can do this. We can do this. And then they get to Samaria and they go, wait, wait, hold it. Jesus, you misspoke. Did you mean Galilee? Did you mean, wait, not Samaria. Samaria are the, um, they're the bad people. Did you forget Jesus that they, they worship on the wrong mountain? Did you forget Jesus that they're half breeds? Did you forget Jesus that they're not like us? Did you forget Jesus? I'm sure at this point his disciples went, oh, you misspoke Jesus. Sorry. Did you forget, Jesus, that they're not like us? They don't like us, Jesus. We don't like them. You see, when we got to this point, my soul stopped because at this point, Jesus said, I'm going to put a check and balance into the system. I'm going to literally ask you to stop and look at something and look at a situation that, well, it's tough. I'm going to ask you to Go and talk to people that are not like you. I'm going to ask you to take a look at people that, well, hate you, that are not like you, and that you might hate as well. I'm going to use some inflammatory language because these people are different than us. They may hate us. These people you actually might be afraid of. Dare I may say it, these people you may hate. 
I'm going to use a brief illustration to teach you something from my life. Growing up in the 1970s and being a commissioned officer in the 1980s, a natural enemy were the Middle Easterners in my life. You see, growing up in the 1970s, we had oil embargoes by the Arabs. We had Iranian hostages. We had bombings. And we, we were afraid of an entire culture of people that we knew nothing about. I knew nothing about growing up in the 1970s. In the 1980s, at the close of the Cold War, we moved from being afraid of this great Russian aggressor to this culture and these people we knew nothing about and we were afraid of them I was taught to be afraid of them formidable we didn't know their culture we didn't know their religion and we were afraid of them and we were taught to hate them we were taught to be afraid of them and to hate them we were taught that they withheld oil from us and they, they took our hostages how many of you grew up I, I know I shouldn't ask that I'm not going to but I was going to ask how many of you watched the hostage crisis the Iranian hostage crisis on television where they put the, the banner, 70 days hostage crisis, 71 days hostage crisis, 72 days, until they finally got released when uh, President Ronald Reagan got elected. Yeah, only a handful of us did that. You see, we grew up watching this, and it, it stemmed fear, which created hate for us. And we, we grew up, and then we were taught about these were Muslims, and we didn't even know what that was. I didn't know what that was. And we grew up, this entire culture, these entire people were all lumped into this category of people that we were afraid of, and we didn't know who they were. But they were a threat. They were told, we were told they were a threat. And so, from that, we, told, we were told, hate and be ready to fight. And I was commissioned an officer and told to stand watch. And yes, I deployed to Desert Storm and to Desert, well, Desert Shield. and Des I didn't go to Desert Shield. I went to Desert Storm. But I deployed to Desert Storm. And I'm not proud of this. I wasn't saved yet, so hear me. Hear me. I wasn't saved yet. And I went to war as, as a man who um, hated an entire group of people without understanding why I hated people because I was told to hate people I was told to be hate people because they hated me and here's what I learned hate and fear are evil kissing cousins if you and if we're honest with each other hate and fear causes us fear of people causes us to hate people if you're afraid of somebody that causes us to hate somebody and see, I, I was wanting to, well, I'll be honest with you. I was deploying to war and I was afraid. I was afraid for all the reasons why men are afraid when they go to war. And I was afraid, and because of that, I turned it into hate. And rather than to process it the way, um, a healthy way, I processed it into hate. And so now, I come back from the war, and... And now I, and I, and I, I find Jesus Christ. That's the, that's the good news story. And he takes his hate and he takes his anger and he, he saves me. And he saves me and he replaces his hate and his anger. And now I get a new heart. And I get this new heart, but I still don't know what to do with this hate and this anger against this entire uh, people that I don't understand. I don't know. And guess what? In 2017, guess what? The very first international mission trip that God calls me to go on it's to Greece, and it's to go to meet that man that you just saw on the screen, and it's to go to serve people that just two decades before, 15 years before, that I'd been called to, to be an aggressor against, that I called, and I found out that even as a Christian, that all this hate that I had had not gone away, and that I had to process this now as a believer, and here's what I want to share with you. My fear and my hate had not gone away. You see, even as a believer... I have to process this. So here's what I wanted to share with you. I had learned in John chapter 20 that when the disciples were in the upper room, 
they, Jesus had been resurrected. He had been hanging out with them for a while. And the disciples were in the upper room, and they were afraid of the Jews, and they were afraid of what was happening. And Jesus shows up with them. And in our, and, and, and our uh, transcript of the Bible, he says, peace be with you. But what he really says is, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. You see, Jesus shows up, and he says, you have nothing to fear. And Jesus showed up in my heart because here's the fact. Jesus already had their hearts. He already had my heart. And he showed up and he says, you need to stop being afraid of these people. You need to stop being afraid of these people because I've already forgiven you. Now, you need to get over your fear because your hate is in the way of what I have for you. Because of your hate, you've got to get over this because you're standing in a way of love. And see, I had learned the same thing that these disciples had learned. You need to stop being afraid. Now, when fear gets in the way, fear means I'm afraid because I'm not trusting God. You see, I wasn't trusting God to trust, to, to take advantage. I wasn't trusting that, that God has something better for me. I wasn't trusting that God loved these people enough to save them. I wasn't trusting God enough that he would, he would have good things for these people. I honestly felt like Jonah. I said, I don't want to go and tell them the good news. You might save them. I didn't even know these people. So where does he send me in 2017 with four members of my family? He sends me to meet this man. He sends me to minister to these people. And I fall desperately in love with them. I fall desperately in love with them. God replaces hate with love because I am no longer afraid. The fear gets pushed aside and the fear leaves me. You see, because Samaria is where my Samaria, the point is Samaria is where you are afraid to take the gospel. And as long as you're afraid, you won't take the gospel there. And so I found myself pondering, why are Christians afraid? What is, why are we afraid? If Samaria is where you're afraid to take the gospel, then why are we afraid? And the textbook answer is afraid is because our faith hasn't allowed us to grow yet. We haven't placed all of our faith in Jesus Christ. We're afraid because we don't believe that God, we can trust God. Now, I'm not talking about the fear that comes from the natural fear. I'm not talking about the fear that comes from like, like at the beginning of the pandemic. When, when COVID first broke out, we were afraid, weren't we? Well, see, that's natural and that's good fear. When you're confronted as an organism, when you're confronted by, by something that, that you don't know what it is, it should frighten you. And, and until you get a chance to bring it under the control of truth, it should frighten you. You know, I'm a hunter. And when I'm in the woods and I'm making a way in the middle, in the morning, when I'm making it my way to my deer stand in the dark, and I'm walking along, and if I confront, a, if I walk up on a bear in the woods, it scares me. Now, I have genuine and real fear. Now, oftentimes, it's not a bear. It's just something else. But in my mind, it's a bear, particularly, particularly during bow season when I have one shot and it's one and done, which is usually throw the bow at them and run. But that's real fear. When you're in an organism and you come up on something that, you, that it scares you, that's real fear. And now your mind has to process it against what is truth. And so when we ran up against COVID, we didn't know what it was. And so now you have to process it against now Jesus is in control of the universe. Jesus is either going to allow you to live or not live. And it's his choice. We had to process that. So I'm not talking about the, the, the momentary fear that allows you to fight or flight. I'm talking about fear that is, that doesn't, that, that is not in, under control of your faith. But real fear comes from lack of faith. And that lack of faith is when you're still hanging on to the lie that you're in control. You see, you're not in control. We are not in control. God is in control of everything. And the sooner we can process that, the sooner we can give our fear over to God and we can say, listen, Lord, I am afraid, but I need you to take that fear away and I need you to take control and do what you do best. If we want freedom to go to Samaria, where that is a place that scares you, then trust fully that Jesus will take away your fear. Now, I believe Jesus challenges us with Samarias in our lives as a process improvement so that we can continually discover what scares us as we grow 
so that we can continually turn those fears over to him and continue to grow in our faith. So hear me on this. This isn't a try harder. This isn't your faith is weak. This is an opportunity for you to identify if there's hate in your life or fear. It's an opportunity for you to identify this is an area that's a Samaria for me. This is an area that I need to start working to turn that over. A Samaria is a place that scares you. Does it scare you? A Samaria in my life at one time was my family. There was a time when I was afraid to tell my family that I had come to Jesus Christ. I was raised to be a man who stood on my own two feet. I was raised by a father who told me that God was a crutch that people used who did not know how to take care of themselves. I was raised where we made fun of people who went to church on Sunday because they did it to get out of work. I was raised as a farmhand where Sunday we worked and people who went to church oftentimes did so so they wouldn't have to work on the farm. Now that doesn't mean that true believers were not going to church for the right reason, but we made fun of them because they did it to get out. We perceived they did it to get out of work. When I came to Christ, I was afraid to tell my family that I was following Jesus. There came a day when I actually had to sit down and confront my family and said, I am now following Jesus. That was my Samaria. Are there Samarias in your life? And that's what I'm sharing with you. This is not your, this is not your, your faith is bad. You need to get better at it. This is a chance to say, are there Samarias in your life? Are there things that scare you? Are there places in your life that scare you? And if there are, those are your Samarias. Those are the places that you need to turn over to God. And that's where your faith can grow. So I know this sounds like I'm asking you to go on faraway missions, dangerous places, and asking you to sign up to go to fight battles. And indeed, I am. I'm asking you to fight the battle of fear. And at this point, many times I'm asked by people, if it's so easy, then where's the proof? How come there's no proof? You know, fear is rampant in this world. Where's the proof? And I'm going to give us three proofs. Jesus gave us three proofs when he left this world. He indwelled us with the Holy Spirit, and he said, here's the three things that are tangible, measurable, and obtainable. First, your baptism. If you've given your life to Jesus Christ, if you said, I'm a sinner and I know it, and Jesus come into my life, pay my sin debt so that I can have eternal life, and now you can be baptized. Baptized through immersion, that baptism is a proof that you can look back on every time that is a time in your life where you've said, I will die to my sin with Jesus and be resurrected in a new life in public. And you've made that public declaration that is a proof. You can look back on that forever and ever now and say that I've made that commitment. He gave that to us. He gave it to us as an ordinance. He said, do that in remembrance. And he said, now do that. And now you have that. That is a proof. I did it. Baptism doesn't save you, but is a proof that you were now baptized and you have that. I have it written down in my Bible. I have people that witnessed it, and it's a memory of mine. I said, I have followed Jesus, and I, and I did it. I went public, and I did it. The second one is what we're going to do today. We're going to communion. Every time you take communion and you recognize that broken body and that spilled blood, it's proof that you, you recognize what Jesus did on that cross for you, and you're accepting that forgiveness. You're accepting what he did for you. And you're saying, thank you, Jesus. I remember what you did. I remember what you did for me. And I'm accepting that. And the final one is the church. Your battle buddy sitting right next to you. Every person who's accepted Jesus Christ is going through the exact same thing you are. They've gone through the death, burial, and resurrection, through the baptism, and through the communion that you've gone through. They've accepted the same Jesus that man you saw on the screen has accepted the same Jesus you did. 
The, the meal with the missionary that we had here last month accepted the same Jesus. When, this, when the same church that's overseas, that's in Africa, that's in India, that's in Greece, the same church. You see, the church is standing against the gates of hell today. When you take a look from the, from the Acts chapter 1 all the way through today, the church is the proof positive that Jesus is still alive, that Jesus meant what he said. Don't discount the church. It, it breaks my heart. When Christians just wander away from the church, they're just loose sheep just wandering around out, out, out there. They say, but I need proof that Jesus is alive. And I said, look at the church. Would people all over the world be worshiping the same Jesus, be gathering together and remembering their baptism, taking communion together and worshiping together if, there wasn't, if this wasn't the proof? Your battle buddy right here is proof positive. Until Jesus comes back to get you or until you go to see him, Here's your proof. Look at your battle, buddy. Here's your proof. Beyond the bonds of fear comes the freedom to love and be loved. So let me conclude. Jesus promised us a new life and a new heart. He upheld his promise. We have the Holy Spirit deposited in us and sealed to the day of redemption compelled by the joy of our salvation and our new life, Jesus asks us to share his new life with the people that are like us, with people we have a lot in common with, and with people that are nothing like us. We are powered to do this to the reality of our salvation that frees us from the fear that our pride clings to. Beyond the limits of our fear comes a freedom to love and to be loved. Today, I have outlined three points for today's application. First, get ready to celebrate your freedom in Christ today by taking communion with us today. In a moment, we're going to take communion together. Get ready to celebrate that. This should be a celebration point. That's why we do it every week together. We don't do it so it become routine. We do it so that we can celebrate together. It's one of the three things Jesus gave us. He said, remember this, remember me. Get ready to celebrate this. Throw off the bounds of fear. Do not be afraid anymore. Fear leads to hate. Throw it away. Remember, be free from your fear. Number two, confess your fear and find freedom to fully trust in Jesus' goodness. Church, it's time to be free. I could do, we could do an entire sermon series on anxiety, on fear, on, on anger, on all the things that we just talked about today. I just touched on it in the form of Samaria. I challenge you that this is a process. Samaria is the place that scares you. Throw off the chains of fear today. If something is, scares you, that's a place for your faith to grow. Confess your fear and find freedom. And number three, ask the Holy Spirit to send you to Samaria. You see, if you're afraid to go, then be like I was in 2017. Not only did I ask him to send me, did it heal my heart? Yes. But if we had the courage, I took three other family members with me. Ask the Holy Spirit to send you to Samaria. He loves those prayers. Because when you do that, it stretches the bounds of your faith. It stretches your love. Turns your, turns your fear to love. Let me pray. So, Lord, today we got to read your word. We got to read one verse. And, Lord, I recognize that uh, as we move from Jerusalem to Judea and into Samaria, Lord, we recognize that uh, it can be difficult to love the, the ones we do not know, to love the ones we've, we've learned to, to fear. But, Lord, I ask that you'd break down those barriers, break down fear. I pray that you prepare our hearts now, Lord, to come into communion with you. And if there's fear in our heart, and indeed, Lord, if there's hate anywhere in our heart, Lord, that you would identify that for us so that we could learn to love more deeply, love more freely, and enjoy you more deeply. Draw us into your presence so that we could be more like your son. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Thank you, Pastor Bob, for bringing us the word. Church, beloved, we're going to go through this time, what we call response time. After we hear the word of God being preached like that, we need to respond. And we respond with worship. We respond by recognizing what our God has done. And I love how every single time we preach from the word of God, there's a connection to what we're going to be doing now, which is communion, right? The fear that Pastor Bob was talking about, the fear of going into your Samaria, how do you quell that fear? The question of why, and the, the question is really going back to, well, why do we even do this? Why do we come to church? Why do we worship? It goes back to your relationship with the Lord. And this is why it's so beautiful, because our Lord has given us a specific way to remember Him, and it is through the Lord's table, communion. So in this response time, we're going to take communion. We're going to take a time to give you time to respond. Again, if you have any prayer requests, respond. Write it down. Take the time to actually write it down. Pass it in the black box. Give it to me. We're going to pray for it. It is a time to give your tithes and offerings as well. And, uh, of course, for communion, uh, it is a time where we remember what Christ has done for us on the cross. In uh, 1 Corinthians 11, it shares about how Christ, on the Last Supper, he offered up his, this bread, he broke it, and he gave thanks, saying, this is my body broken for you. It is a reminder of how our sins that we have committed against God have been paid for, right? This, the wages of sin is death, but they've been paid for through his death on the cross. And after he broke the bread, uh, he took up a cup of juice, and he says, this is my blood shed for the new covenant. What does that new covenant mean? It means that we are not saved by works. We're not saved by how good you are or how bad you are. You're not saved by your church attendance or the things that you do inside the church. You're saved by the blood of Christ. You're saved by faith alone. So that if you believe with your heart that Jesus has paid the price for your sin and he is Lord and Savior, he is the only way to the kingdom of heaven, you are saved and you get to enter eternity with him. For those of you here today who are not believers, you're still on the fence, you have a lot of questions about our faith, we ask you to just sit it out because communion doesn't really do anything, it doesn't mean anything, but we are more than happy to share what it's really all about, about this Jesus that we follow. So what I'm going to do is pray. Uh, after I pray, please take communion. Uh, there's a station here, one in the back as well. Give a response, pray, and we're going to sing some more songs and give praise to our Lord. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much, Father, as you sent your Son, not only for our salvation, for that would have been good enough, but Lord, you have also sent him to live among us and to dwell among us, Lord, and to show us, Lord, the perfect way of living, to follow you perfectly, Lord. And it was this perfect man, the sinless man, that gave his life for our sins for our salvation, for our life, and for our relationship with you. So, Lord, we, we recognize and we remember that, and you've given us such a beautiful reminder through this act of communion as well. Lord Jesus, as we have heard your word today, as we recognize, Lord, you are the one who first came and loved us. You are the one who first came, Lord, and went down to be among sinners, Lord. You did not just simply give your life for those who are your friends or your close ones. You gave your life for sinners like us. And so, Lord Jesus, when we recognize and remember that love, may we go out to our Samarias, Lord. May we go out to our Judeas. May we go out to those to preach this gospel even to our enemies, Lord. For once we were enemies to you, but you have forgiven us through your love. Lord Jesus, thank you for who you are and what you continue to do for us. And we pray all these things in your name. Amen. Let us celebrate communion together.
loved us so much, loved us so much that you have given us your own son. And we take that for granted sometimes. Um, as a gift that you've given us that there are many people who don't have it. And as we reflect on your body and your blood, Jesus Christ, we thank you for giving yourself for us that we, though your enemies, have been brought near to you. God, we pray for those people who we find difficult to deal with, difficult to befriend, people who would even declare that they are your opponents, that they have no interest in knowing you and that they never will. God, we pray that you'll open those people's hearts to be able to also come to your table and to eat and drink life everlasting in the name of Jesus. If you guys want to stand and sing <clears throat> together. If you want to continue praying, feel free to do so. Mystery of the cross, I cannot comprehend. The agonies of Calvary. You, the perfect Holy One, crushed your son. Drank the bitter cup reserved for me. Your blood. Washed away my sin, Jesus, thank you. Father's wrath completely satisfied, Jesus, thank you. Once your enemy, now seated at your table, Jesus, thank you.
life that we can live and give to you god thank you in the name of jesus amen amen all right thank you so much we are so happy that you came out this cold indoor church service with us so thank you for tolerating the cold uh as just a token of our appreciation feel free to take a hand warmer it is really hot so they're up actually near the front door just very quick couple of reminders uh after church service there is prayer so please join us in the conference room afterwards to be prayed over and to pray with us as well and then also there's one more thing that i'm forgetting but if it was important i would probably remember anyway right so all right just pray for the heater for the heating uh, maintenance guy to come and fix it by this week so <laughs> pray for that Go and serve your Judeas and Samarias as you leave today. Let me praise, uh, pray, and uh, close you guys out. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much again that you are worth it, Lord. Even though we are afraid, even though it is awkward, even though it's difficult, even though they may hurt us and hate us, Lord, you loved us so much, it is worth going out to our Judeas and Samaria. So thank you, Lord, for that reminder. So Lord, open our eyes this week, especially to the people that we see and we meet. May we look at them differently this week. May we look at them at the lens that you look at them. Lord, made in your image, needing a Savior, needing your love. Use us once again, Lord, to bring you glory through the preaching of this word, the preaching of this gospel, and the hope of Jesus. Father, we pray all these things in his precious name. Amen. All right, go and enjoy. Have a good week.